and we're going to be looking again at Abraham. And this is, if you have the sheet from last week, you have the sheet you need. Um, we didn't make it all the way through that. And I will just uh, give you the fill-ins for the points that we've already done. So if you're, you weren't here last week, you'll be able to fill those in. And this is a study of Abraham, a faith-filled friend of God. And this first lesson is stepping out in faith. And the first point we dealt with was the call to faith. And God wants faith that leads to action. God wants faith that leads to action. And then the second fill in there is God wants faith when things are hard. And then we made it through number three, which God wants faith when things are unclear. And so we're on the second main point, the promise for faith. And that's where we'll be starting tonight. And you have a few notes there if you weren't here last week under each of those points that I just gave you and that'll give you kind of an idea of where, uh, where we have been in this study. We started out the study with just the idea of if God were to write your epitaph that kind of summed up your life, what would it be? And we saw that Abraham was probably one of the greatest um, historical figures in church or in, in biblical history because he showed great faith. And, but he was also faithful and when we, when we use the, the term faithful, it's got a little different meaning than faith-filled. And that is he was, he was true to the commitment that he made. And God blessed him for that. And so that's where we come up with a faith-filled friend of God. There's three times in scripture where it mentions that Abraham was a friend of God. And one of, two of those times are in the Old Testament and one of them's in the New Testament. So it's emphasized that he was definitely a friend of God. So we're gonna start on the promise for faith. And this will be uh, all of the lesson for tonight. The promise for faith. So what if, what if we do what God asks of us? God asks, and the focus of, our, of last week was primarily that of the Lord ask a great deal of Abraham. He, and let me have you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. And just to give a little bit of perspective on the timeline that we're looking at, from the time of the creation up until Abraham, if you look at his death, that was about 2,000 years after the creation. So in 12 chapters, or 11 chapters, I should say, the account that we're given in those 12 chapters actually covers about 2,000 years. And so uh, it's a significant amount of time before we get to the book of, a or not the book, but the character of Abraham. And again, I was saying that the focus of our, of the lesson last week was on how much uh, Abraham sacrificed to follow God. God told him while he was sta still in the Ur of, Ur of the Chaldees, I want you to take up everything and move to Canaan. And it says that he, he went to um, Haran, which is really further north, but it was, it was uh, northwest 
of where Ur of the Chaldees was. And it says there they, they stopped and they stayed there for a while, evidently because of Terah, his father. So he took just his immediate family members, Terah, uh, and then uh, he and his wife, Abraham and his wife, and then Lot. And we don't know how long they were there, but it seems to be a significant amount of time. And then, and then finally, I think after Terah died, then Abraham moved down to Canaan. But the Lord didn't tell him where he was going. He didn't just say, pick up and leave. He's, or he, he didn't say, I want you to go to Canaan. He said, I'll tell you where you're going to go, but he didn't tell him right then. How would you like that if God did that to you? Said, I don't uh, move, get ready, get settled, uh, get, get settled to go, and then not tell you where you were going. So what if, what if we do give, give it all up and follow after God, then what happens? God makes some pretty big promises to Abraham and we need to be careful to see how these promises could apply to us today. And we want to see some practical helps here. And first, obviously, as we look at verses 1 through 3, let, let's read that. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us uh, the principles that we can apply to our life by, from the life of Abraham. And I pray, Lord, that this would be very practical and would speak to our hearts. Show us that you, you don't work exactly, maybe in the ways that you did back then, speaking verbally, but you, you do guide us and you do call us to things that often stretch us, things that we were not expecting and there are sacrifices to be made. And I pray, Father, that you will teach us the principles that we need to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. First, we need to realize from this that these promises are the first major step in bringing redemption to Adam's fallen race. And so we need to think of these promises theologically. And what I mean by that realizing that ultimately they point to Jesus Christ and at the same time we can see how the principles of the way that God works with Abram have some instruction for us as well. But these promises were given to Abraham for the nation of Israel. And, um, but it's also given to him for the blessing to all the nations of the world. And that's remarkable. He said, I'll make of you a great nation. Obviously, he hasn't promised that to us. Or that all the nations will be blessed through us. He hasn't promised us that either. But as we study the story of Abraham, we can make general observations about the ways that God responds to faith and really carefully seek to apply it to our own situation today. So let's look at God's promise. God promised to reward Abraham. And in those verses, verses two and three, there's at least three ideas, key ideas that will be picked up and developed throughout the Abraham. Abram's story. First, there is the promise that a great nation will come from Abraham. And that's in verse 2. And that applies to several things. First of all, it applies to both many nations 
and a territory or a land that those descendants will live on. And I don't want to go too far because I know that'll be for another lesson. But if you look at verse 7, he says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So the descendants are attached to the land. They're going to have a land, all of his descendants. And after the promise, God says that Abram will be a blessing. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And he would do that. And, and, the, and that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. And that's in verse 3. And even though Abram would not live to ever see that the Israelite nation would always revere him as the father of their nation and the one who trusted God for the promises that followed. And so Abraham would always be looked up to. And whenever the people would talk about their history, Abraham was the first person. He was the first patriarch, a patriarch of faith to whom God revealed himself. And when you think of those 2,000 years, you, you come to Abraham and you realize that um, God did a great thing. I, as I was meditating on this, I thought, you know, someday we'll see Abraham. He'll be part of the new Jerusalem. Maybe he'll be part of the millennium, I don't know, but he'll definitely be part of the new Jerusalem the millennium is going to be focused on, um, on Israel. There will be Gentiles, but uh, the focus is on the fact that God has fulfilled his promises to Israel. And that's what the millennium is all about. These three key ideas, first of all, the seed or the descendants, um, and then the land, and then the blessing that will serve all nations as well as the Israelites. That's going to kind of be part of the general outline for many of the future episodes of Ab Abraham's life and for the story of Israel as a whole. But it's also important to notice that the land and family blessings are some of the very things Abram was being asked to give up. So God promised, and this is important, God promised to reward Abram by giving him what God was asking him to give up. And this is true for us as well. Jesus said that those who sacrifice for the kingdom will find that God rewards them richly both in this life and the life to come. Turn to Matthew 19. Keep your finger in the Old Testament there, but go to Matthew 19. And look at verse 27. He says, then Peter answered and said to him, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the son of man sits on the throne of his glory, you will have followed me. You who have followed me will also sit on, the tw on 12 th thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. So that is what is, I believe that's the principle that we can take from Abraham's life. God does reward those who step out in faith. How how can that apply to us today? I mean, what sacrifices, what are some of the ways that God rewards those who sacrificially live faith-filled lives obeying him? 
What are some of the ways that that can be fleshed out? Maybe you have specific even illustrations of that. I remember when Seth, our, our second son, he really had an interest in the military and he felt like he needed to really surrender that to the Lord. It was such a, such a, a want for him. And then when he was in Bible college, some chaplains came through and they, they preached on the need for chaplains in the, in the military and the ministry that can go on there. And he called us and he said, Dad and Mom, do you think that might be what God has for, for me? And we said, well, we think that's a very good possibility. And it was something that he surrendered. And after he surrendered it, God gave it back to him. But in the way that he, the way that God wanted him to, to do it. And we have seen God's blessing on that in numerous ways. Have any of you thought of anything? All right, Marilee. Um, this may be kind of crazy, but um, I remember I became a Christian and gave my life to the Lord when I was living at my mom's house. And that was not a good place for me to live. So I think the Lord gave me an apartment at your apartment. Okay. Bless me with my own place to live. Is okay. That, All right. Is that kind of what? Yes, in the sense that God is faithful to provide for our needs as we surrender our lives to him, as we strive to follow him. And God blesses even the simplest of faith when we step out and we're looking to obey him. Okay, Stephen. Okay. Yeah, and, and they were praying that the Lord might allow them to get there by this September. And that's what happened. The Lord provided all the support and they were able to go. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Sometimes we don't always see all the rewards that God might give right away. And that's where we have to exercise faith. I think of sometimes uh, when a Christian couple announces that the, they feel the Lord has impressed upon their heart the mission field and their extended family may bring up all the reasons why they don't think it's a good idea. You know, a lot of lack of socialization for the children or you won't have enough to live on um, or your children will be limited educationally or diseases, you know, depending on where you're going, danger from religious zealots. And, and yet all of those things are possible. And I remember reading John Payton's um, biography, which was very challenging, but when he decided to go to the New Hebrides Islands, which are on the south end of South America, off the coast, uh, the eastern coast there, he had a man say, you shouldn't go there, they're headhunters. And, but that's, that's the people that he felt the Lord wanted him to go minister to. And he knew there were dangers, but um, he said, you know, you might die there. And he said, well, 
when you die, the worms are just going to eat you. So what difference does it make? And he, he said, if I'm going to die, I'd like to die in the middle of God's will. And others don't understand that mindset sometimes. So... There is a sacrifice, but there are rewards. I'm reminded also of what David Livingston said when he, somebody asked him, why, why would you sacrifice all that you sacrificed to go to Africa? And he said, it's not a sacrifice. It doesn't even compare to what Jesus Christ did for us. And so he, he really didn't consider the sacrifice. I think also much of what we think about regarding trusting God by faith, in other words, some, some of the opposition that we, we sometimes think of, um, you know, it may cost us materially or how it will affect our comfort and our convenience or how it will be perceived by others, whether unsaved people or those even in the Christian community. community. Even in the Christian community, it sometimes is looked at as radical and extreme. But that is not the way God thinks about it. And so we need to, we need to think of it biblically. Why do we as Christians sometimes shy away from the promise of reward in Scripture? How might we find a balanced way to correct that idea of uh, the, what should we be motivated by those rewards? Why, why does God put those in Scripture? Any thoughts on that? Okay, all right, good, good. Any other reasons why somebody might shy away from that? Yeah. Sometimes people might look at them as works too. You know, God honors works or I want, some, some people might say, I, I don't wanna, I, don't, I know that we're not supposed to think that works makes us any better and, um, but God honors works that are done in faith. Faith, trusting him, standing on his word and the rewards become, really becomes testimonies of God's faithfulness. And if we, like you said, if we serve for rewards, that seem, might seem selfish to some, but it, it just, it's depending on what we're doing it for. Are we thinking of it, that it's God rewarding for faithfulness and we're, we are striving to please God, but for the purpose of help, helping us, he, he gives us rewards for the purpose of helping us value the eternal over immediate selfish pleasure like Jesus did. And that's what he says when he says, um, have this same mind in you that was in Jesus Christ who left heaven and he came as a servant and he was willing to be crucified. And then what did God do? It says God gave him that name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. That's, that was his reward for what he did. I don't think it's the only reward. It's, it's also our souls that he was purchasing for us. God is pleased to give us rewards when we do it for his glory and for the good of others instead of our own glory. I had someone 
and this, this is somebody that's not in our church, it is somebody that visited our church about two years ago and he just happened to text me the other day and um, I, we had texted a little bit after he visited church, but um, in his text, I had asked him, how are you doing spiritually? And that was taken to mean, how are you? Are you doing something for the Lord? Are you doing some good works for the Lord is the way he took it. And, and he said, as, as I've looked in scripture, I have never thought of Christianity as a due religion. And I, I wrote him back and I said, well, actually it is a due religion. There's a lot of things that God commands us to do, but he commands us to do them for his glory. I said, when, before we're saved, nothing we do is good. We can't do anything that is pleasing to God because it's all mixed with the wrong motivations. But once we're saved, if we do it for his glory and the power of his spirit, in, in a, as, as a matter of faith. We were believing his promises and we're believing in what he told us to do. And, and I said, when we do that, then it's pleasing to him. And I gave him many scriptures to, to show that. Even like, uh, children obey your parents, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Do you remember what it says? What does the rest of the verse say? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. What's the rest of it? Yeah, he gives two promises that it may go well with you and you may live long on the earth. And that's the reward that he's offering to, to motivate us to follow him by faith. And it gives hope. And so... That's what we need to think of when we're, it's the reward, but we need to connect it to God, that it's his faithfulness, it's his, his grace and mercy that he even puts those things out there like that. So, then look at the, the second point there, God promised to work through Abraham. For instance, Genesis begins with the, this glorious, beautiful creation of God's universe and the earth and then him creating man and woman and putting them in this uh, perfect garden and then, and then tells how man's sin caused it all to go seriously wrong. And then the next few chapters describe man's descent into depravity and wickedness in Genesis four through six. And then God's judgment and grace on sinful humanity in the flood. That's chapters six through nine. And then man's continued rebellion against God, which kind of culminates in this city, the largest city on earth at that time, which is called Babylon, where they built the Tower of Babel. And they're wanting to make it to their own glory, build it to their own glory. And rather than make a grand announcement to the king of the most important city on earth at the time, God kicks off his grand plan to save humanity by going to this Chaldean who very likely was, he was brought up in an idolatrous family. His Terah, his father was an idolater. It tells us that. And, and it's very possible that he was as well. Abraham was until God spoke to him. And he asked him to leave everything and follow him. And fortunately for the rest of us, Abraham said yes to that. And he trusted God. And God uses people of faith to be conduits of blessing to other people just like he did Abraham, and that's what he wants all of us to be. We might not have the, um, the fame that Abraham does, but we will be seen as important in God's eyes and that we did his will. 
God didn't need Abraham. He doesn't need us. But he chose to use man because that was his plan. That was his design. And in his kindness and grace, he chooses to use people who believe him to get incredible things done by faith. Not perfect people. Abraham wasn't perfect, and we know that from the scriptures. There were times where he didn't believe God. And, but he was still faith-filled because he kept following God. And people who trust him and prove that they trust him by the way they live, those are the God way the people God blesses. You know, when the five men went to the jungles of Ecuador and lost their lives, they believed God would use them to reach the Wadani Indians. Did he reward their faith? How? Okay, eventually. Yes. And there were two of the wives that came back, and yes, that was exactly right. In fact, one of the men who speared the missionary later told the missionary's son, who came back with the missionary's wife, and he told his son that he was the one who killed his father and even took him to the place where it happened and where the, the airplane pieces had been buried. And he told his son after his father had been speared and was gasping for breath, he kept saying to the Indian, we are your friend, we love you. And those were the words he just kept repeating it over and over again until he died. And this Indian man, what's interesting about all this is that God was doing something in those Indians before that ever happened. Because that Indian was tired of the blood being spilt between tribes and even within their own tribe. There was jealousy, there was power grabbing going on. And he told his wife, he said, I'm tired of this. There's got to be a better way. And the whole plot against the five men was a result of another Indian that was trying to get power and he was trying to force this man's hand to kill these people and to keep the blood going. And the Indian man had doubted whether they should kill the missionaries because he was tired of doing that. And when the missionary was there gasping for breath and still, um, and still saying, we're your friend, we love you. He didn't see the fear in that missionary's face that he saw in the people, his own people when they died. And he wanted to have what that missionary had. He had been telling some of the other Indians that this is bad, we shouldn't be doing this. And it was that communication of love after he had speared that missionary that he knew that he needed to find out whether this was so. And, and that's why when those missionary wives came back, they were open. That's amazing to me. That's amazing to me that, that that went on. And we see that happening. I've got to make sure I have all the pieces here. Here we go. And just like those five men, Abraham never saw any of the promises. And yet they believed that God had called them to do this. 
and they knew that there was risk involved and their wives knew that there was risk involved. He didn't, Abraham didn't see the blessing and the promises God made were still unfulfilled. He had, all he had of the promises was the one son, the son of promise. And even that God put him to the test on. He didn't see a nation. He owned a single burial plot, not the land of Canaan. He didn't have the land of Canaan, although the burial plot was there in Canaan. There was no worldwide blessing through Abraham. So how did Abraham account for that gap? The gap between what God had promised and what he actually saw. And the answer, of course, is what? Faith. He believed God. And once again, the author of Hebrews hits the point clearly and powerfully. Let me have you turn there to Hebrews 11, verses 13 and following, down to verse 16. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And you see verse 17, by faith Abraham when he was tested offered up Isaac, that was a true test of faith. But God did it. And Abraham believed. What are some things that would look different in our lives if we truly believed everything that God said about himself and us? Think about that. And I recognize that God doesn't call everybody to go to the mission field. And I'm glad of that. <laughs> I'm glad we, but God has called all of us to minister the gospel to people wherever we are. And, and there are needs and I believe it's, I believe it would be a blessing for everybody in our church and any church where the, that is a faithful church for everybody to visit the mission field. Your, your life might very well be transformed if you did. How can God use faith-filled people in the course of their everyday lives to help God accomplish his grand promise of redemption today? How can we do that? taking those opportunities to minister that might open doors and the one command he gives for all of us is to go into all the world. And so that is very, very important. Follow his leading when we are impressed through prayer and scripture to do something. If God be 
It could be from personal Bible study or preaching or just hearing the word read that our hearts are heavy. God puts it on our hearts, but it's a command. It's not, it's not something that we ought to be um, pulling back from or uh, growing tired of. It's something that we ought to be doing all the time and giving our resources to. What, what can we do when we are struggling to believe God because what we see doesn't line up with what he says? For instance, I, I know a lot of people that have gotten discouraged because when they did evangelize, they didn't always see the results. Good. Yeah, very much so. So reminding ourselves of it, I think reading material that is, that is very much uh, lays that upon our hearts. Anybody else? Sarah? Okay, good. Yeah, very good. And I, I think that what you said about oftentimes God's timeline is longer than ours is. And, but that's one of the reasons why he says that we're all to be ready. We're always to have our candles lit expecting him because we don't know when we'll be called to be with him. And when you look at the timeline of the Old Testament and you see the Lord, he told the people that about captivity, that it was going to come, but it was 40 years, several generations out because he was giving them time to repent and turn back to him. And so God's call and his promise to make Abraham a great nation when he didn't even have an heir at the time. And that went on for 25 years until he was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. And when God finally said it, Abraham started laughing. And how am I going to have a son at this age? And my wife, who's 90, how is she going to bear a son? You know, sometimes, this is what challenged me too, sometimes we're good for a sprint, but not a marathon. And yet God chooses things according to what he knows we need. And so I believe this is one of the things that we can learn from the life of Abraham, just starting right out here with his life. He asked of him, a, a man who really didn't know God. He, he had no Bible. He had no Old Testament. He had no inspired documents. All he had was the voice of God and God telling him, you need to pick up everything and, and go and I'll show you. And he did. So we won't always be able to see how God's promises are true or could be true. But like Abraham, we can look behind those promises to the God who is always faithful and is worth believing. And it, even at, at my age, and I look back at some of the things and there were different trials that took place. And as I look back now, I see the practicality of those difficulties 
and how they, they intersected with my needs and what God was, how God wanted me to grow, which I wouldn't have seen going into it. But God is always faithful and he is worth believing. So we need to ask ourselves, how can we have the same faith and the same reward, not in the sense of the exact same reward, but see the rewards that God wants to give us? And those rewards are promised in the New Testament. And principally, principi principially we see it even throughout the Old Testament. So these are the questions that we're going to explore as we go further into the life of Abraham. Let's, let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for this time of seeing how there are many similarities between the way you work in our life. That is what you are trying to do because we learn through scripture that what pleases you is faith. And Lord, we pray that we will exalt you and trust you and glorify you even when we can't see the future as we would like to. We can't see your purposes other than the fact that you've told us your purpose is to grow us and make us more Christ-like and to help us to trust you more. And so, Lord, I pray that you would deal with each of us, Lord, according to your will. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.